Good morning. Good morning. Good morning. Good morning. I was glad when they said unto me, let us go into the house of the Lord. If you are excited about being alive today and being in the house of the Lord, can you put your hands together and give the Lord some praise this morning? I am happy to be here this morning to celebrate with you and to celebrate with your pastors, Reverend Branch and Reverend Chandler. I am excited to be here. What a long two years this has been. Um, I bring you greetings from Springfield Gardens United Methodist Church, where for those who identify as Methodists know that Springfield can be a rather strange place. And Reverend Stone sends his regards and his love. And um, I did not come alone. My mom is here with me. Amen. And um, she very much was like, oh, you're going inside church. I'm definitely coming. I'm like, mom, you know, they have Zoom, you know, it's still a pandemic going on. I'm coming. So, you know, you can't argue with your mom, but for so much. And I do see that one of my social work colleagues, Renee, is here as well. So I'm happy to see her this morning as well. Um, I always find it very interesting when pastors invite me to come to preach for their celebrations or their anniversaries because I am not a pastor, but if Reverend Branch has anything to do with it, she'll say, not yet, beloved, you know. <laughs> Oh, so y'all know, y'all know she says, you know, y'all know how she does. And so I know that some people uh, like to know, how do you know my pastor? Because I know that some saints are pretty protective and they want to know, how do you know my pastor and who are you and where did you come from? So uh, I met Reverend Branch at my time at Drew when we had to do supervised ministry. Oh, what a challenge that was. And I did not have a place to do my internship and the school year had started. And so um, I, that's when I read Reverend Stone in the parking lot. I didn't even know him. And he came up to me and he said, oh, I know where you're gonna go do your internship. And I said, who is this person? And how does he know where I'm going? I don't even have a, um, he said, I know somebody, I know where you can go. And I was like, okay. And then I went and what a wonderful time it was. Uh, Reverend German has a way of convincing you of what you should be doing for the Lord, even when you are very resistant <laughs> to doing those things. And so what I will say, Reverend, uh, Reverend Bridge, I'm so happy that I've met you. And there are many times in my journey in ministry and in life where I wanted to speak in the known tongues that Peter is very uh, affiliated with. And I hear Reverend Branch's voice, now beloved. There is another way to address your concerns. Oh, so y'all know about that too? And so there are plenty of people out there in the world who should be thinking, Reverend Branch, that I have not let them know that I am fully acquainted with the Holy Spirit and those tongues and the tongues of known languages. So will you join me in praying together as we hear from the Lord this morning? Gracious God, we thank you for another day. We thank you for this opportunity just to live and to breathe and to be alive. We thank you for this opportunity of worship. And so God, now we need to hear a word from you. For without a word from you, we will not know what to do. So spirit of the living God, fall fresh on us in this moment. Help us to see you, to know you, and to do as you would have us to do. In Jesus' name we pray, amen. amen. This morning I would like to preach from the thought, pastoring through a theological change. Pastoring through a theological change. It's very interesting today that I would be here where we are celebrating two women in ministry in 2021, where there are still differing theologies about women serving in ministry as pastors. Just this year, a pastor by the name of Reverend Ratona Stokes Robinson was appointed to an AME church in New Jersey in June of this year. 
and on her first Sunday of her appointment where she went to serve, the church officers refused to allow her in and refused to give her the keys because of her gender. And for months, she went to the church every week with her husband, stood on the lawn and preached, unpaid, blocked from entering the church. A group of women known as the AME Women in Ministry organized. They brought awareness. Many people who serve in ministry and many people who participate in congregations use their social media to raise awareness about this issue and to contribute financially to someone who is serving without pay for months without pay. And after all this attention was brought to this issue, the bishop went to the church and made the church allow the pastor in and paid her retroactively for all the work she had done from the lawn of the church where she was refused entry. It would make sense in biblical times if I was to tell you a story like that, or maybe it wouldn't. Or it would make sense if it was the 1800s and I told you a story like that, or it wouldn't. It would make sense in the 1920s or 1930s or 1950s, 1960s, maybe it might make sense that I would tell you a story like that. But in the year of our Lord, 2021, that I would stand before you and tell you a story like that, some of us would find that to be strange. Yet I imagine all the women in this room could tell you a story about being locked out, about being overlooked and about not being seen and about being invalidated because of their shape or their clothing or their hair or their nails <laughs> or of their singlehood or of their partnership or of their sexuality or of their education or of their family name or their location even their age maybe even their abilities seen and unseen overlooked locked out blocked out and unfortunately we of faith need to know something that either we are the reason why certain things happen to women in ministry or we're the reason why they change theology the study the discipline the practice of getting to know the nature of god and articulating it comes about by our lived experiences about our educations how we are raised how we are trained in the scriptures but theology is not something that just happens in a seminary it's not something that just happens in our churches. It's not something just, that just happens on the lawn in front of a church where you are locked out and blocked out. It happens in our everyday lives. It's not just enough to know that you need the Holy Spirit. You've got to also know that the Holy Spirit invites you to examine yourself and to change your ways. Theology is not just something we think about, it's literally what we do. Why we preach from podiums, why we wear robes, why you light these candles, why we give offering the way that we do, or why we say the prayers that we pray, or why we structure services the way that we do. It's because of theology. Somebody, somewhere, at some point in time, took the time to think through who God is, what God does, and how God wants us to be. And if we think about history, 
Theologies can be used to be very uplifting and empowering and help to set people free, you know, like black liberation theology or womanist theology or feminist theology. But then there are theologies that lead to detrimental and deadly outcomes, such as slavery or the Holocaust or having pastors stand on lawns, preaching unpaid, locked outside of the church. Theology can function to help people to live or it can function to help people to die. As I was thinking about coming, and I was so once again surprised to come because sometimes when I do go places to preach, I might stir the pot. I don't look to stir the pot. <laughs> Only if I'm cooking do I like to stir the pot. But sometimes the spirit wants me to stir the pot. And I say, spirit, why? Why would we do this? And it's because there is a justice issue going on in our churches as it pertains to women, and God is simply not pleased. As I was thinking about women pastors and I was thinking about Reverend Tisa and I was thinking about Reverend Robinson, immediately the text of Lydia's conversion came to mind because there's differing theologies about Lydia in terms of what her role was or contribution was to the faith. We like the fact that Lydia is a woman of prayer and that she was wealthy and that her resources allowed for a church in Macedonia to exist. But sometimes in our reading of the text, we overlook the fact that Lydia is a Gentile, that Lydia is not a Jewish woman. We overlook in the text that prior to Paul meeting these women, women, praying by the water, practicing faith in the public. The leaders of the church in the previous chapter were having a theological debate about Jews and Gentiles. It is no shocker to me that women were absent from the conversation, or so that's what the text would lead us to believe. And there was Paul, and there was Silas, and there was Barnabas, and there were Peter, and they were having an argument with the other church leaders on should new Gentile converts be circumcised under Moses' law or not? And some people said, yes, they should be circumcised to demonstrate their commitment to, to this belief that we have. They should do this. And then some people said, no, we shouldn't stand in the way of allowing people to embrace this, this truth of the gospel because God's grace is sufficient enough for that. And we shouldn't create barriers and roadblocks for people to join and come. We should just embrace them. Does that sound familiar to anybody in the room? But some people didn't agree, and they went back and forth on what we should do. And then they decided that they were gonna send Paul to go back with some people and let the Church of Antioch know the decision. But if you've been in church for a while, <laughs> you know that it wasn't that simple because as soon as they made a decision about what to do, there was an argument. Who's gonna go with Paul back to tell the church what happened? And they were like, we're, I'm gonna go, well, I'm gonna go with you, I'm gonna go with you, but then one person in a previous chapter, because of other theological debates, had abandoned some of the, the leaders of the church and left them to deal with things on their own, when they decided that that brother was coming, they said, we ain't taking him. <laughs> he left us, he abandoned us. Why would we take him to, to talk to these people? I mean, he can't come with us. 
So people was upset and mad and split off. Does that sound familiar? And some people went this way and some people went that way. And then here goes Paul praying and receives a vision of a man telling him to come to Macedonia to spread the good news. Paul is one of the pastors of the early church. A lot of people love Paul. Some people can't stand Paul. Some people have mixed feelings about Paul because Paul, a learned man, trained by the best, a Jewish man who is also a Roman citizen, went from being the leading persecutor of Christians to one of the leading pastors. How does that happen? Theological changes is what happened. Paul went from hunting down Christians and getting them arrested and killed to being hunted down for preaching the gospel himself. Paul experienced his own changes in the way he thought about God and who he thought was worthy of the grace of God and who he thought was worthy of the validation of God. And then he got knocked down off his high horse. for God to say, I am God, and I am the one who created everyone, and no one has the authority to say, who deserves my love, and who deserves my grace, and who deserves my validation, and who deserves my affirmation. And so Paul gets this vision oh, to go to Macedonia to start a church and when he went there, he was looking for days. Do y'all know what he was looking for? He was looking for the men. <laughs> he went to look for the men because the rules were, when you go to start a church, you got to find 12 men of faith. Theology. you got to find 12 men of faith and talk with them to establish a church. So Paul was walking for days. <laughs> Looking for the 12 brethren of faith. And he didn't find them. Then he said, oh, let me go down by the water because sometimes that's where you find the synagogue. Not necessarily the building, but the people of God. Yeah. That's where they would go to worship and to pray. Yeah. Now I imagine that some of us whose roots come from Africa know a little bit about going down by the water yeah. to pray. Yeah. And what did he find? A group of women. Now let me stop right here, because I feel the thickness rising. We love the men. I'm talking about the text. Paul couldn't find any men in the story. I'm not talking about the brethren who are gathered here today. We love you, brethren. I'm talking about what happened in the story. <laughs> All right? Are we on the same page? Because yeah. I don't want any saints to bother Reverend Chandler or Reverend Branch later. I'm talking about what happened in the Bible. <laughs> the Bible. So now back to the story. That happened in the Bible. He finds the women praying, and he goes to them, and he ministers to them, and in that group of women is Lydia, who had already been worshiping with these women for some time, and had already been a woman of prayer. And I wanna pause, because sometimes when people come to our churches, 
We are so quick to indoctrinate them with something before learning who they are and what gifts they bring. It's stewardship month, right? Every person that comes through the door has a gift. And before we want to fill them with our church rules, let's find out who they are, what their name is, where they live at, what language do they speak? Do they need an interpreter? Do they like to sit in the back or the front? That's a part of theology, how you relate to people how you welcome them, how you see them. So Lydia is already a part of these group of women and she hears Paul's message and she decides that she's gonna follow the way of Christ. And because Lydia and those women were praying, a church was started in Macedonia. We oftentimes forget how the gospel came to be that it was the women who went to the empty tomb first. Amen. The women who were in the cemetery looking for Jesus and he was not there because the women weren't afraid of the soldiers. The women weren't afraid to be killed and they weren't afraid to be arrested. They came out to do their things that they must do because, you know, culture. They are responsible for taking care of the dead. And they came back and told, Jesus ain't there. If those women never went to the tomb to see if Jesus was there, we wouldn't even be here right now doing what we're doing today. So it seems to me that something has to happen, pastors, with our theology to do the work that God calls us into. And so Paul models for us some things that we can do to pastor through theological changes. First, you gotta pray. I know that sounds so simple, right? Like from Sunday school or the Methodists call it church school, from church school, everything, pray. And we be like, yeah, you know, we know that already. We're supposed to pray about everything. No, you're literally supposed to pray about everything. Yeah. Like literally. Yeah. Because sometimes the saints, now I'm talking to the pastors, the saints will encourage you to speak in those known tongues that Peter is very well acquainted with. And you need to pray because the people are doing the best that they can and they need support and encouragement. And then sometimes it's not the people, it's the denomination. I'm gonna leave that alone for now. And so you have to pray every day. God, what do you want me to do today? Where do you want me to be today? What direction should I take these people? What should I tell them? Even during a pandemic, I felt so bad for pastors because people really still wanted to be in the building while people were dropping like flies. <laughs> and pastors had to say, do we go inside the church or do we stay home? And then let's not talk about technology because that tried to take us all out of here. <laughs> Changing remotely for everything? And I know a lot of people were like, theology didn't have nothing to do with that until you had to do a virtual funeral. Until you had to do a virtual dedication or virtual communion. And then it became, who gonna bless the elements? Can we even do this through Zoom? Do we have to wait until we meet in person? Did anybody have these questions, curiosities, wonderings? Can you baptize somebody virtually? Do 
they have water where they at? <laughs> and right then and there, from one Sunday being in church to the next Sunday being on Zoom, your theology changed. Because then we had no choice but to realize that the Spirit of God is everywhere. And wherever the people of God is, that is where God is. And I can worship God at home. And I can worship God on Zoom. And I can worship God in the church. And I can come to the building when it's safe. And then, some of our people of faith, some of which in the evangelical tradition, there was theology is about wearing a mask. There's theology is about whether you should be vaccinated or not. And using people's faith or what they define as lack of faith to encourage people to do things that are detrimental to the public good. That's why theology is important. That's why prayer is important because would you want to serve a God that wants people to be safe? Or would you want a God that wants you to take a risk to show your faith and maybe kill everybody in the process? So you have to pray to know what God wants you to do. And then Paul shows us something else that more pastors need to start doing. Make your stance known. The days of having pastors who are afraid to say what they believe is over. You can't be so preoccupied with your paycheck that you don't stand up and declare the truth about what God wants to see God's people doing in the world. You can't be wishy-washy. You can't flip back and forth. Let me make it more concrete. Either you believe that God created everyone and therefore LGBTQI persons should be affirmed as persons and in ministry, or you don't. There's no room to flip-flop. Do you believe it or no? Make your stance known to your people what you believe, why you believe it, what scriptures, you know, because the saints, some people forgot the Bible we were supposed to read. <laughs> and tell the people what you believe and give them room to develop their own belief. Because they have their own faith journey to walk. But the days of pastors hiding behind robes and pulpits in their offices is over. People need to know where you stand on vaccination. People need to know where you stand on important issues. And then Paul models that no matter what it is, you have to move forward. A lot of times, people of faith love to talk about love. Love. I love you, my sister. I love you, my brother. We love love until it's time to do love. We love to talk about, we are one in the spirit. We are one in the Lord. We are one. We are unified until it time comes to make decisions on concrete things. Acts is such an important book because it shows us how the early church developed and that even in the midst of theological change and conflict, the church still grew. That even in a splitting off, the church will still grow because it's God's church. 
is not our church. It's God's church. And as people of faith, we have seen the church, even in our lifetimes, split and grow. Black people, we had to go. <laughs> because you can't say I'm created by God and still want me to be a slave. That don't make no sense. You can't have me work in your farm and then tell me to come take communion. That doesn't make any sense. And so we have to move forward. We have to pray, make our stance known on what we believe God wants us to be doing. And then we have to move forward. We can't sit and wait until we have to wait for the whole church to agree. If we waited for the whole church to degree, agree on things, we wouldn't get anywhere. You gotta move forward. And then Paul shows us that you have to model for people what God intends. They just finished having an argument about how to embrace the Gentiles. And in the literal next chapter, Paul had to demonstrate what that meant. He had to be where Gentiles were. We want to be effective as Christians in our discipleship, in our stewardship, but we don't want to be where the people are that are the ever. We, don't, we want to be with the people who are like us. But the gospel calls us to go out into all nations, into all places, everywhere, which means that there has to be an expanding into the areas where the people don't look like us, don't talk like us, are not like us. But it doesn't matter because they're being created by the God that we love. And so my word of encouragement to the pastors is that even when theological changes are going on, God is with you. God will empower you. God will give you vision and strategy. And people will follow you. This is the word of God for the people of God. Thanks be to God.